Please be seated. Uh, I think I have a job for you, Mel. Could you please bring my sermon? Oops. I'm not. I thought it was going to be an honor for her. So you spoiled the whole thing. It's good to, have, to be in the presence of God, isn't it? This sense of joy as we had the, the children's uh, song and the buzz about it and the, 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 God, the God we serve is a God of joy, but also all of a sudden it is changing to, you know, if you like, a more serious note. In a sense, what God is doing out there, people committing their lives, and the kingdom of God at work, that's lovely. That's lovely. It's just by faith we Christians can live between these two poles. Yeah? Joy and mourning and, 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 and happiness and, and then sadness and challenges and commitment. But this is the very nature of God's kingdom. Amen for that. Uh, we continue our series of um, preaching on Psalms. Uh, Dr. Sun last Sunday, he talked about God's majesty, how powerful and magnificent God is. So today we are going to explore Psalm number 37. Is a wisdom psalm. As you know, the reading is quite extensive, so I won't be reading the entire psalm, but I will read bits and, bits and pieces of the psalm, but probably you're going to concentrate on the first uh, seven verses of the psalm. If you open your Bible, Psalm 37, if you, have a, if you are um, a Christian, you open your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, go to a Christian who has one. And you can read it. I'm all fire today, I'm tired. <laughs> sorry. I'm not sorry, to be honest. <laughs> Do not be fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither, like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when, he, when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful morning, Lord. You have been talking to us as we prayed before in different ways. It's special, but it's different. Continue to talk to us, Lord. Continue to challenge us. Lord, continue, oh Lord, to bring, continue to bring upon us this joy, oh Lord, and this ability sometimes to be still before your presence and ponder. Talk to us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. The wisdom psalm is called that way for a reason. The Psalm 37, as the Psalm 1 and other Psalms, which are called wisdom Psalms, are called because they are very similar, first, to Proverbs, to Job, Songs of Songs and Ecclesiastes. They have a very similar literature. But above all, what, what makes a wisdom Psalm a wisdom Psalm is, is the fact that uh, it tends to contrast the life choice made by those who are righteous or serve the Lord with those who, you know, 
are so-called in the Bible wicked, who don't not, do not serve the Lord. So every time we, we, you read a psalm that makes this contrast, you know we are talking about a wisdom a psalm. There will be always a contrast, but that's not very relevant, just for, your, just for me to show a little bit off and for you to get a little bit of a knowledge. But the first seven verses sets out the traits of the righteous. I believe we are all here righteous people, aren't we? We are righteous because God made us righteous through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We have to remember ourselves time and time again that God looks upon heaven towards the earth and did not find a just, not only, only one. But by Jesus Christ, our lives were rebuilt, or for some of us, our lives, including me, are in the process of being rebuilt, made righteous by the sacrifice of Jesus. But there are certain traits, aspects, that a righteous person should have. And we can see it very well spelled out in Psalm 37. First, he says in verse 3, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. By the way, when I said about the contra contrast, it, some of these psalms make between the righteous and non-righteous, makes I think one thing. Since the beginning of time has been part of human nature to be jealous and envious of others and to compare ourselves to others. Do you know, when you wake up in the morning, you, you see through the window of your bedroom, you see straight into your neighbor's garden, and the grass seems to be greener than yours. <laughs> Open up the door, look at the driveway of your neighbor's, his car, although it's the same years of yours, but it looks like shining more than yours, you know. Oh, the children of your friends are always better than yours. It's part of your human nature to be jealous and envious, isn't it? Has been like that. And probably it's going to be like that all the way through. But in this psalm, God spells out how the righteous should live and should actually deal with these envious and uh, jealous spells that come of us from time to time. It would be ridiculous for me to say that I have never felt that way. I have. All of us have at some point in life. But the first thing is trust. Trust in the Lord is the first characteristic or trait. Trust for me is, is, a, is, is, surrender, surrender, is a, a, a unconditional surrender to God. Not just to God, but to his will. It goes to the point that I don't understand the circumstances. Probably what God is asking me to do looks and sounds crazy. But I have decided unconditionally to surrender myself to his will. Therefore, I will trust. I have decided to put everything I have everything I possess in the hands of God, and I will trust he has the power, the expertise to deal with it. That's trust. In that moment, when I come before the cross of Jesus, normally crying, and I put all my needs at the cross. The opposite of a trust would be as I walk my way home, I then think, actually, am I sure? Do I believe Jesus is going to deal with it in the proper way? And I go back 
and I start to pick up the things I believe I can do on my own and the things that are easier for Jesus to deal with. But trust takes us to that step where I leave everything there because I know God knows how to deal with it better than I do. I think it was Luther, Martin Luther, who said, Luther King, who said, everything I had and I thought I was in control, I lost. But everything I put in God's hand, I still have them all. I was talking to Clady, she was uh, sharing her experiences, you know, in uh, the Saturday night congregation. Of course, you know, in the Saturday night congregation, you can preach for an hour. I'm so jealous. That's one of the things I'm jealous and envious. <laughs> yes, always green over there. And one of the experiences she was sharing last night was of this man, this couple in Afghanistan, you know, I'm just trying to remember, and uh, you know, uh, they were doing some uh, underground evangelism in the city, and there was this Taliban man with an AK-47, AK you know, with a huge beard. By the way, I have nothing against you if you grow a beard, just kind of <laughs> big one, you no, know, very um, grumpy face. And, uh, and this couple heard from the Lord, the man heard, go and give him a Bible. It's, it's kind of a suicidal mission, isn't it? And he said, God, if I go there and I give him a Bible, is it over? Am I, am I telling, is it over? I'm going to be killed. Do as I told you, go and give him a Bible. And you know, in her eyes, as you are thinking, struggling with God, the wife came. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the wife said to him, I feel like you should give this, that man a Bible. She did not say, I feel like we. <laughs> That's important. As more detail. But I feel like you should. You know, and, and the, when the wife talks, you just need to obey. You know, be man enough and obey. And he went to give the Bible, you know, was covered in a blanket or a lot of paper. And he said, God asked me to give you that. He, I, can't, I don't know, but probably he was shaking, wasn't he, guys? God asked me to give you that. And probably waiting to be, you know, shot dead. And that man took that small package, start to unwrap it, unwrap it, and unwrap it, and there was the Bible. And when he saw the name of Afghanistan Bible, he started crying. And he said, I have been waiting for this for five days. I don't remember the, the rest, but that was it, yeah. You know, I have been waiting for this for five days because God told me he was going to talk to me. This is trust. This is to unconditionally surrender ourselves to the will of God. Trust is to obey and obey unconditionally. The other aspect is law is joy. The other trait is trust. But in joy, dwell in the land, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give the desire of your heart. Enjoy yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the things that God gave to you as much as you delight yourself in God. You know, uh, I did some Google stuff to see the meaning of the word Google, because nowadays we first go to God and secondly we go to Google to solve all our problems. 
And joy is, is, is the synonymous of joy is, or enjoy is like, love, be fond of, be pleased by, find, take pleasure in, be keen on, delight in, appreciate, rejoice in, relish, revel in, adore, lap up, whatever it is, save, savor, drink in, bask in. I have to get this one, wallow. Yeah, in the morning I was not so brilliant. Wallowing. Wallow, wallow in. By the way, it's W A L O W in. Which means indulge, indulge in something. The only thing we as Christians are allowed to indulge in is in God, not in sin. But to enjoy His presence, to delight in the Lord, you know, to understand why we are here today. To make God the priority of our lives, the center of everything, the hub around which everything in life revolves. Find joy in life. I don't know why we Christians sometimes are so miserable. You know, we are considered to be very grumpy. Should not be that way. We more than anybody else should understand the real meaning of life and how wonderful life given by the God we serve is. But the principle of everything is when I find delight in God, when I enjoy His presence, when I spend time with Him, then all of a sudden life makes sense. Of course it does. Because He is the author of life. And life starts in Himself. Commitment is another trait. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He in Him and He will do this. He'll make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the moonday sun. You see the intertwining, the connection between the entire thing. All of a sudden, it makes sense. Trust, joy, enjoyment, commitment is all part of the same coin. Yeah, no, of the same coin, yes. <coughs> commitment is very precious. It's a very precious word to be spread too thinly. We cannot have allegiance to two kingdoms. At some point, we need to decide where you are. Look what K. Arthur is very harsh, I have to say, but I love it. If you do not plan to live the Christian life totally committed to knowing your God and to walking in obedience to Him, they then don't begin, for this is what Christianity is all about. It's a change of citizenship, a change of government, a change of allegiance. If you have no intention of letting Christ rule your life, then forget Christianity. It's not for you. It's painful, harsh, but it's true. Nonetheless, it's true. Commitment is a change of citizenship. We now belong to our citizenship's heaven. It's a change of government. We live under God's kingdom. It's a change of allegiance. Commitment makes us think that we don't live anymore, any longer for ourselves. Only, but commitment makes us think once again that we are all under the Lordship of Christ. And if there is not two minds about it, we are either part of God's kingdom and enjoy all the delights, all of the goodness, all of the blessings that come as a result of being under His Lordship 
or we are, we are not under his lordship, and therefore we are not entitled for the blessings. That's a harsh reality, but it's a reality. Some of us, we want all the blessings, all the goodness of God, all the goodness he has, all his miracles without being committed. We need to change. We need to understand what commitment is. Commitment is that place where we find ourselves... he's paid was the price of death for me and for you. But there is joy in commitment because the picture here is not just that when I'm committed I will suffer all the time. No. Therefore, that's why the author of Psalm... Yeah, I'm, I, know, I knew I was right, yes. Because he says, you will dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. There are blessings there. There are goodness. There are love. There are care. There are safety coming from God. But on the other side, there is also commitment. And we need to learn, you know, the meaning of the word commitment. And then the other trait is stillness. I hope, Chris, I will survive this job today after this preaching. <laughs> Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Stillness is the other trait. The ability of be still before the Lord. The ability of um, be quiet before him. You know, we live in a very busy society, don't we? Rushing about, doing things all the time. The more you do things, the more we have the sense that we are somebody. If you are not doing anything, the sense is we are nothing, we are nobody. You know, I went through a phase in my life that I need to prove a point to God, to myself, and to others that I was worth it. And the way I did was you know, occupying my agenda 24-7. If my agenda was not busy, it meant I was, not doing, I was not doing well. If it was busy, wow, yes, so I'm worth it. You see, I'm a busy person, appreciated by others, requested by others. I'm worth it. But stillness before the Lord, be still, and the ability to listen take us to the other side of the pond. Scientifically, it's proved that most of us live in what we call automatic pilot. We do things without realizing why we do. Think about it. Sometimes you are driving, you go through a, red, uh, a traffic light, not a red, I hope not, go through <clears throat> a traffic light, you turn right, turn left, without realizing it. We do it because it was a habit. You are on automatic pilot. And you do things without being mindful of it. Stillness makes us to disengage our automatic pilot and understand why we do the things we do. And no Christian can go through his journey all about singing and dancing. Hey, hallelujah, woo! At some point in life, we need to create the ability to be still, to wait, to listen, to reflect. Why I do the things I do? Why I serve God the way I serve? Why he asking me? The busy person has no ability to listen to what God was doing because he's too busy. He can't listen. Can't understand. We become human doers rather than human beings. 
But in stillness, we sit, we wait, we listen, we reflect, we ponder, we understand why we do what we do, and we understand that we are human beings, servants of God, not only human doers. By the way, I said to the congregation this morning, that's not a call for you to drop your ministries. We do need people doing some stuff here, by the way. But find a balance. Verse 12, 15. Start to make us understand the full picture here of what the psalmist talking about. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked for, the, for, he, knows, oh, for he knows the day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend the bow to bring down the poor and the needy to slay those who ways are upright, but their swords will pierce their own hearts, and their bows will be broken. The righteous is not forsaken by God. The righteous that trusts is never forsaken by God. God will still be his or their provider. Our trust is not in the uncertainty of riches, of the riches of this world, but in the living God. You know, all the riches of this world will vanish one day, but God will remain the same. Of course, riches are good for us to invest in God's kingdom, but it's not the main cause of our existence. In verses 19, 23, 25, he says that the righteous leave us having nothing and yet possessing all. Verse 19 says, In times of disaster, I will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. It's beautiful, isn't it? In times of disaster, I'll be there for you. I will supply, I will provide your needs. I will be there. You are not forsaken by me. Verse 21, if you are somebody who are always concerned about your finances and the little you have, be content because verses 21 and 22 says, the wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous gives generously. Those the Lord blesses will inherit the, the land, but those he curses will cut will be cut off. If the Lord delights in man's way, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumbles, he'll not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hands. 25. I was young, and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Because God will always be there for us and is going to be always our provider. These are not my words. These are the words of the Lord. And you need to make this exercise all the time. It's, they are not intended to be just here in this book. They need to pop out of this book and all of a sudden they become a reality in our lives. The righteous lives by faith. 
because he knows he does not need to have to be. He is regardless. He has. You keep struggling with a society who tends to show or dictate to us that we are unless we have. But we are because Jesus is in us. And regardless we have, we'll continue to be. It's too philosophical for you. So once we go home, reflect on it. The righteous does not become selfish. The righteous, having nothing but yet possessing everything, has the ability with the little they have to make others rich. This is called compassion and generosity. Uh, I know uh, somebody told, to me, told me once it's easy for our hearts to get converted, but our bank accounts find extremely difficult. <laughs> I'll say it again. I know. <laughs> It's easy for our hearts to be converted, but our bank accounts find difficult. They struggle with the notion of conversion. The righteous is generous. The righteous cannot live in richness where half or more than half of the world are living in famine, in, in struggling to make, you know, uh, the daily bread. And finally, the righteous are cast down, but not destroyed. We read 24, 23, 23, 24. There will be ups and downs in life. You know, you did not sign up for something that's going to be, you know, always exciting. It's going to be adventurous. And even in tough times, God is teaching us something. It's going to be a, a bumpy ride, Tom. It's going to be all right in the end. Cast down, but not destroyed. Disappointments, yes. Unplanned circumstances, yes. But I can't we can't help but hear what the word of God says, God's hand will always upheld us. Or uphold us. We may stumble from time to time, but not fall. Because we learn something as righteous. Do you know one of the most important messages? in our journey with Christ, that the righteous never, ever, never, ever throw the towel. We never give up. We never give up, regardless of the circumstances. Our commitment, our trust to God, our moments of stillness, our ability of finding joy will tell us that God has never turned back from us. That God will be there always upholding us. He'll make our steps firm when you delight in Him. And then the last two verses. 39 and 40, you know, ends with a very calm tone, which is, find, is found in the beginning of the psalm. The Lord, the Lord is the righteous rescuer. The Lord is the righteous fortress. The Lord is the righteous shelter, and above all, the Lord we serve 
is our Savior. How couldn't we serve such a good God? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desire of your heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you very much for the promises we find in your word. Thank you for your presence throughout the service in the different ways you spoke to us. But one thing, Lord, we ask you, make your word grow in our hearts, Lord. Make your word come to life in our hearts. To the point that, Lord, we'll never forget who you are for us. In Jesus' name, amen.